Okay, in this set of notes, um, we're going to talk about the first and second lines of defense against disease, and eventually in the next set of notes, we're going to talk about the immune system. Okay, and before we begin, we're going to talk just a briefly about um, what scientific method has been done to determine which bacteria or viruses or parasites are causing what diseases. Our bodies are always full of bacteria and viruses. So how can scientists tell which of these bacteria or viruses is causing a particular disease? Well, there was a German physician by the name of Robert Koch who in the late 1800s designed the following procedure, which is still used today to identify pathogens. And these are what are called Koch's postulates. Um, in step number one, the suspected pathogen must occur in the body of an animal with the disease and not occur in the body of a healthy animal. All right, so you have to have a suspected pathogen, but if you find it in one and not in the other, you, you're on the first step. Step number two, the suspected pathogen should be isolated and grown in a laboratory culture. That means that you have to basically grow it on a Petri dish. Step number three, if a healthy animal is then inoculated with this culture, that animal should develop the disease. So you take the whatever you grew on a Petri dish and you literally inject it into a healthy animal. If that healthy animal develops the same disease, you're probably on the right track. And then finally, step number four, the pathogen from that second animal that you inoculated should be isolated again and grown in the laboratory. If it is the same as the pathogen isolated from the first animal, you can be fairly certain that you have found the cause of the disease. Keep in mind, you have trillions of, of bacteria inside your body. So this is a fairly slow process. All right, to get started, there's two vocabulary words we need to learn and to differentiate from one another. The first word is pathogen. A pathogen is any organism that causes disease, and it includes things like bad bacteria. Remember that your gut is full of good bacteria or bacteria that you don't even care about. Um, some of that bacteria helps you. Some of that bacteria just takes up space. Um, but only, quote unquote, bad bacteria are considered pathogens. But also viruses and parasites are pathogens. An antigen, on the other hand, could be similar, but an antigen is a foreign protein. Anything recognized by the body as foreign that triggers an immune response. That could be the capsid of a virus, which is made of protein. It could be the proteins on the surface of a disease-causing bacteria, or it could be the proteins on the surface of a transplanted organ. That's why we reject organs, unfortunately. If someone transplants a kidney into another person um, and the proteins on the surface are not a tissue match, then the white blood cells identify it as foreign and they attack it and they can actually destroy the kidney in this circumstance. Um, even with a tissue match, the individual who receives the kidney will, will probably have to be on immunosuppressant drugs the rest of their lives, which means that they um, will forever be more likely to come down with diseases and even cancer. Now, what we're going to start talking about first are called the nonspecific defenses. These are defenses that the body has which protect us against all pathogens. The first line of defense are things that you've probably known since you were in elementary school. For example, the skin prevents all pathogens from entering the body. The mucous membranes secrete a sticky fluid that traps pathogens. Other parts of your first line of defense include things like your sweat, your stomach acid. Stomach acid is um, destroying pathogens that might be in food that you eat. Um, your saliva, the cilia, the hairs in your um, nasal passages and in your lungs are sweeping away debris. Those are all part of your first line of defense. The second lines of defense are a little bit more complicated. We're going to talk about three cells that work to attack all pathogens, and then we're going to talk about the inflammatory response. All of this is considered part of the second lines of defense. It's when the first line of defense is penetrated, when the skin has been broken or when a bacteria has made it through the mucous membranes. Um, this is what happens next. First of all, we have these cells that are referred to as macrophages. Macro means big and phage means to eat. Macrophages travel throughout the body and they eat bacteria and other foreign debris. Neutrophils are another kind of cell that patrol the body during the second line of defense. They're sometimes referred to as kamikaze cells. They neutralize an area by releasing bleach-like chemicals. 
Um, this kills everything in the area, including themselves, hence the name kamikaze. It's crude, unsophisticated warfare. It's not tailor-made for a specific disease. Anytime there's infected cells, the neutrophils will come by and drop their bleach bombs, so to speak. The other kind of cell that we'll talk about in this section are the natural killer cells. Natural killer cells release an enzyme called perforin. The word perforate is similar to the word perforin. Um, perforin pokes holes in cancer cells and virus infected cells. Again, it's not tailor made to any particular virus. It's just um, these natural killer cells move in anytime there's a cancer cell or anytime there's a virus infected cell. Now another part of the second line of defense is referred to as the inflammatory response. This is still part of the second line of defense. The inflammatory response is triggered when a pathogen penetrates the skin or mucous membranes. In the diagram, what you're seeing is a splinter and the different steps that occur when a splinter pushes through the skin. There are several steps to the inflammatory response. Any cells that are damaged um, when, they, when it's been cut or when there's a splinter release a chemical called histamine. Histamine increases blood flow to the area. And histamine is a chemical that allergy sufferers are releasing accidentally. The cells of the nasal passages get damaged when pollen or cat dander or dog dander, whatever the person who's allergic to, when that um, debris enters the nasal passages, it damages the cells in the nasal passages, and they also release histamine. Histamine increases blood flow to the area, and it causes an allergy sufferer to um, feel pressure in their nasal passages, to feel um, maybe headachey, to have um, red swollen eyes, to have the nose running, and so they take an antihistamine to make those um, to make those symptoms diminish. In addition, when histamine starts um, causing blood flow to the area, fluid and white blood cells rush to the area. Now that sounds bad. If you have a cut, you'd think that you'd want the blood cell, you'd want the blood flow to decrease, but it's actually just quite the opposite. We want the blood flow to increase so that white blood cells can go there and kill any pathogens that might be in the area. This leads to the sensation of warmth, of swelling, of pain, even redness. Um, and most of you recognize that you might get the inflammatory response after a paper cut or after injuring your hand um, or skinning your knee or what have you. Pus might form. Pus is a good and bad sign. It's an indication that there's an infection, but it's what the body is supposed to do. It's white blood cells um, cleaning out the dead pathogens um, in the area. And then finally, the white blood cells, the neutrophils and the macrophages should be destroying pathogens during the um, inflammatory response. Okay, this is the last slide when we're talking about the first and second lines of defense. These are just other non-specific defenses. The first one is a chemical called interferon. Interferon is released by cells that have been infected by viruses. That chemical warns neighboring cells of an invader and tells them to produce an enzyme that slows viral synthesis so that they can't produce viruses as quickly. The question is, why don't we always release interferon? And the reason we don't always have interferon running is that it takes energy to re release it all the time. So we're saving energy by turning that um, chemical on and off. Another example of a nonspecific defense is fever. Obviously, that's when the body's temperature rises. Fever is actually good up to a point. Fever stimulates the immune system to start dividing. It helps the immune system to divide faster, while at the same time slowing bacterial growth. Now we know that a low-grade fever is actually good for us. It's helping us, and so the recommendation is if you're feeling well to not take Tylenol, um, something that will reduce your fever. Um, but a high fever, we've learned, is very dangerous. Um, you might remember that um, when we boiled liver in the liver lab, that the enzymes denatured, that they melted at approximately 108 degrees. This is a photograph of a Vikings football player who died a number of years ago um, after working out in the summertime during a, a preseason football game. Um, he was throwing up, but he kept playing. Um, it turned out that his temperature rose way over 108 degrees. Um, he died of total system, total organ system failure, which meant that basically the proteins in his body were denaturing, the enzymes couldn't function anymore, and every organ in his body shut down. All right, that's it. The next thing that you want to listen to um, is about the immune system, your specific defenses.